Russia's war in Ukraine has taken an unexpected and potentially far-reaching twist tonight. In an extraordinary development, Vladimir Putin now finds himself the subject of an arrest warrant by the International Criminal Court over allegations of war crimes in Ukraine. He's accused of ordering the unlawful deportation of thousands of children who've allegedly been abducted from their homes in occupied areas of Ukraine and taken to Russia. Kyiv tonight claimed 16,000 children have so far been forcibly taken away from their Ukrainian families. Moscow, which says it does not recognize the jurisdiction of the ICC called the warrants legally void. It has previously claimed the Ukrainian children being removed to Russia were being taken to safety. He's a president who yearns for a place in history. Tonight he has it, though in a way no head of state could envy. A fugitive from justice, a warrant issued for his arrest over the removal of thousands of Ukrainian children from their families. It is forbidden by international law for occupied powers to transfer civilians from the territory they live in to other territories. Children enjoy special protection under the Geneva Convention. The ICC holds President Putin and his children's commissioner personally responsible. They portray their work as humanitarian. The children as orphans, rescued from the front line, offered a new life. But this little boy, Alexander, says Russian authorities forced him from his mother and told him he had a new family. He's since been reunited with his grandmother. But one group that helps bring children home says many are traumatized. Some kids are not really understand what's going on. They've been educated by Russian, you know, books, um, including all the propaganda matters. Some of them have been told by stories that there is no Ukraine anymore. Ukraine claims more than 16,000 children are effectively held prisoner. They call it genocide by deportation. Separating children from their families, depriving them of any opportunity to contact their relatives, hiding children on the territory of Russia, throwing them in the remote regions. All this is an obvious state policy of Russia, state decisions and state evil. Russia's brutal assault has seen killings committed on a vast and well-documented scale. Investigations continue, but they do not, at least not yet, form part of the charge sheet. Tonight, the Kremlin dismissed the ICC's accusations. It does not recognize the court's jurisdiction. It looks, for the time being, as though he might never be brought to justice. But it did look that way for Slobodan Milosevic and for other people in the history of global conflicts. So however confident he may feel at the moment, there may be just part of him that is a bit worried. Putin may not end his days in jail, but the charges are a big moment. A signal that every effort will be made to hold to account the man who ordered the invasion. A warrant for the arrest of a serving head of state is not a step taken lightly. John Ray, News at 10. So what is the institution that's taken this extraordinary step against a head of state, Russia's, Russia's Vladimir Putin? The International Criminal Court in The Hague was created in 2002. It investigates and tries individuals charged with the gravest crimes, including genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity. More than 120 countries are members and are party to the court. But... Crucially, that doesn't include Russia, China and the US, which are not members. Anyone who's convicted can be sentenced to jail for up to 30 years or life. Well, we can speak to Dan uh, in Washington. Um, as I was saying there, Dan, the US isn't a ratified member of the court because they are themselves worried that they could find themselves or their soldiers in a similar position. But the US has reacted to this move by the ICC tonight, hasn't it? 
Yeah, they're in a, a slightly awkward position here, which might explain why there's been nothing on camera here today. But there is a very short statement put out this evening by the National Security Council spokesperson who said there's no doubt Russia is committing war crimes in Ukraine uh, and we have been clear that those responsible must be held to account. You've heard uh, that very angry reaction from uh, Russia earlier on today describing this as outrageous and unacceptable uh, and pointing out that they are not signatories uh, or haven't ratified the treaty which set up the ICC and therefore they don't have to uh, enforce it. Well, uh, the awkward situation for America is that, as you say, that they haven't uh, ratified it uh, either. And it does put President Biden in, in a difficult situation and exposes a bit of a kind of split w within the different institutions here. On the one hand, the White House, uh, the State Department and some intelligence agencies favour uh, helping the ICC as much as they can, given that they haven't, uh, they're not a, a, a signatory to that or ratified that treaty. On the other hand, the Pentagon is, is very concerned. And even just last week, uh, refused to hand over intelligence to help uh, investigations of Russian war crimes uh, in Ukraine because they're worried about the implications for uh, what US servicemen may have done in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. So it, it's a very difficult situation. But there's one thing that may uh, be a takeaway from this is that President Putin himself, although he might not end up in a dock soon, he's going to have to be very careful about where he does travel. OK, Dan, in Washington, thanks very much indeed. Now, Britain's Foreign Secretary James Cleverly tonight welcomed the arrest warrant issued against Vladimir Putin in a statement on social media. He said it is essential that those who carry out what he called horrific war crimes in Ukraine are brought to justice. Well, earlier today, he visited another of Russia's former Soviet neighbours, Georgia. With Russia to its north, Georgia is said to be very aware of what Britain calls Moscow's malign influence. In 2008, Russia invaded the Abkhazia and South Ossetia regions of Georgia for what it called peacekeeping reasons and has occupied them ever since. If ever a country offered an early glimpse of Moscow's military adventurism, it is this one. Georgia knows all too well the impact of war with Russia. Fifteen years on, its land is still occupied by Russian troops, their base dominating the horizon. In 2008, this region endured Europe's first war of the 21st century, as Russian-backed separatists in the breakaway region of South Ossetia launched attacks on Georgian villages. It was a war that showed the first draft of Moscow's military playbook. How to counter it is the challenge for the Western alliance. The Foreign Secretary's tour of former Soviet nations is an attempt to align them more closely whilst offering support. Show me where we are. Now we are here. This is the so-called administrative borderline, where Georgia's control is wrested to Russia, where Russian troops still hold the ground. What's the threat that you think Russia poses now to Georgia? What are the big issues? Well, we're seeing that there is still this physical presence of Russian troops in Georgia. But also what we're seeing is cyber attacks, disinformation, attempts to uh, distort and influence uh, the political environment here in Georgia. But Georgia's own internal situation isn't straightforward. There is great sympathy for Ukraine and a home for many of its displaced. But a wish for closer links with the West is not shared by all in government. Just last week, the country saw rioting when a Russian-style law was proposed requiring media and non-governmental organisations receiving foreign funding to register as agents of foreign influence. It was like a red line for us, you know, to have this law in Georgia and that's why we protested, you know, hundreds and thousands of Georgians we protested against the um, influence of Russia. In fact, it was a, like Russia's attempts to change the Georgian laws and Georgian culture and to introduce Russian-style laws in Georgia. But Georgian society answered with mass protests and I think this protest will continue. High above Tbilisi stands the mother of Georgia's statue. She welcomes friends with a bowl of wine and enemies with a sword. As with so many nations in this region, the war in Ukraine has hastened a reckoning here. 
And Emma is now in the Kazakh capital, uh, where the foreign secretary has this evening arrived. And news of these charges against President Putin, um, does it make these series of visits he's making to these, I suppose, so-called frontline states around Russia even more important? I think the feeling within the team here is very much that this reinforces what they're trying to achieve, which is a broad coalition against Russia, against President Putin, and a team of different countries and organizations who are willing to stand up and say that somebody has to be held to account for what is going on in Ukraine. The Foreign Secretary welcomed the fact that the ICC had actually taken this move this evening because, in his words, he wants to see people who are accused of war crimes be held responsible. So there's no doubt that this reinforces the feeling that visiting countries as we've been to this week, such as Moldova, Georgia and also now Kazakhstan, is a way to try and build that feeling of international coalition. The support on one hand for countries like Moldova, who feel very much in uh, the line of uh, Russian ire, but also there is a feeling that they need to kind of keep on reinforcing these relations. It's important to say, though, that for every action there is a counter. And tonight, Ukraine is facing a barrage of Shahid drone and missile attacks that are continuing into the night.